Lego and video games have gone hand in hand for decades. I actually found this at a thrift store, hidden in with all the audio CDs. This came out in 1998, Lego Chess. I actually had this as a child, and I credit this as the reason why I still know the rules of chess. But, a new Lego game just released for Switch and Steam, and the PC version has rather an interesting feature. It supports ray tracing. It's a pretty exciting topic, especially since Ratchet & Clank on the PS5 uses it to the max and ends up being one of the best looking video games I've ever seen. Lego is pretty much the perfect material for showing this off. It has hard edges and glossy plastic. Heck, there are already rendering tools for Lego models that trace rays. Povray if you're old school, or the EyeSight renderer included in stud.io. However, each frame rendered this way takes forever! Like, this f single frame took two hours on my RTX 2080. It's not really suitable for gameplay. Anyway, the reason this is important for video games is that it replaces, or it can replace, old techniques we used to approximate these lighting effects with, well, what we're replacing it with is a physical simulation of the real thing. Let's focus on reflections for now. So how do most games do them? Well, in modern video games there are two main methods for achieving a reflection. Screen space, where information from the screen is replicated as the reflection, which of course means that once it goes off screen, it can't be used anymore. See how the trees disappear in the river when they go off screen? The other common type is cube map reflections, where a projection of the scene is turned into textures on the six faces of a cube, then reprojected on the reflective surface. See here on the roof and body of this car as the trees rush past. Both of these methods have flaws, so how do ray traced reflections improve on them? Well, like all ray tracing, real physics is used to roughly trace the paths that actual light rays would travel along, and carry the information real light would along the way too. As you might imagine, the downside to ray tracing is that it is enormously taxing on your computer. Hence why both AMD and Nvidia have GPUs with dedicated hardware to perform these calculations, and why both vendors now have upscaling technology to render games that use RT, and others, at a lower resolution and then upscale them to get better frame rates. I don't know if you remember this from high school physics, but specular reflections are reflections on a solid plane that reflect all the light in one direction, creating a sharp virtual image. To roughly approximate this, we can shine a laser pointer through the fog and imagine that the GPU is calculating millions of these laser pointers and then cleaning up the output, in addition to all the other things the GPU normally does, enough times a second to create the illusion of motion. Damn. So back to the actual video game. How do we know that it's actually tracing those rays? Well, there are several things cube maps and screen space reflections can't do. Case in point here, you can see the light is obscured, but it still reflects in the wall. If we turn ray tracing off, you can see that the light now completely disappears when we move the camera to obscure it. That means this reflection is screen space, and noticeably improved with the inclusion of ray tracing. In a prior scene, I thought I'd take a super resolution image just to show how much reflectivity is on display here. You can see the handle on the character, the 1x1 pyramids on each other, and my favourite, the yellow bin distorted in the trash can. This honestly looks like a render, if you showed me this as a still image. It's a messy one, thanks to my poor PC and DLSS struggling to keep up. Oh yeah, DLSS. Let me give you a quick rundown on that. Got it? Cool. Let's keep going with reflections. In fact, let me run a quick render of a similar scene myself, just to see. Well, it's not exact, but that's likely a result of the different material settings in the game. The trash can is much less shiny, but when I set it to chrome, it's too shiny. Oh well, you see what I mean. Now for the elephant in the room. This game kicks my PC's ass. RTX is no joke. Even with DLSS, I'm still getting a mere 30 FPS. Alright, I've knocked the resolution down to 1080p, I've turned off DLSS, and this is to set a baseline for my RTX 2080. Uh, let's see. 35... 33 to 35 FPS? That sounds about right. I know this isn't a fair test, but on the right, <laughs> I have the same level, with the same settings, at the same resolution, running on my wife's PC, which has a GTX 1080, the prior non-TI flagship. 
and we're getting a stunning 7 frames per second. It does look good though, <laughs> I'll give it that. All 7, <laughs> all 7 per second. But this is why you need dedicated hardware for features like this. Of course, I would love to compare AMD's ray tracing hardware to NVIDIA's, but I mean, in this the days of the chip shortage, I'm lucky enough to have the graphics cards that I do, let alone let alone brand new ones that are rarer than chicken teeth right now. I hope this video has been informative. This game is a beautiful experience. Not the longest game in the world, but you're if you were okay with the lengths of the Stanley Parable, Donut Country, that kind of indie game, it's definitely worth a play. Doubly so if you're lucky enough to have been able to buy an RTX 30 series where you'll actually be able to play this with all the settings cranked up to the max. Feel free to flex your frame rates in the comments section. I'll see you next time.